Welcome to Voices of Care, the podcast series from New Cross Healthcare that seeks to get to the very heart of the issues facing the health and social care sector in the UK by truly asking the questions about how we can enable the healthcare workforce of the future. I'm Sahel Mirza, and we're truly in an extraordinary time, not just politically, but also within health and social care. According to some, social care is facing an existential crisis, and others, the NHS is facing the funding squeeze, the likes of which it hasn't seen since the 1950s. It's therefore vitally important to hear from people at the forefront of policy and practice to shed light on the challenges and the solutions that are being implemented. I can think of no one better placed in doing that than my guest who joins me remotely, Sir Jim Mackey. He was recognised and knighted for his services to healthcare in 2019. He's one of the most celebrated and respected leaders within the NHS, Chief Executive at Northumbria Healthcare NHS Foundation Trust and leader of the elective recovery plan for the NHS. Jim, it's always a pleasure to have time with you. Thank you for making time to join us for this. No problem. Good to see you again. Likewise, I'm going to dive straight in. Uh, the NHS is very rarely out of the news and the current political climate has made it a, a centre of attention. Uh, you'll know, of course, that the Health and Social Care Select Committee reported in July uh, 22 uh, that, uh, according to Jeremy Hunt, who's now, of course, uh, currently as we speak, uh, the Chancellor, uh, that the NHS and social care is facing its worst crisis workforce-wise in its history. Uh, you've got enormous experience. Would you agree with that? And what is the extent of that crisis right now? Yeah, so I think this this means different things to different people. It's it's definitely very complex and very hard from a workforce point of view now. Usually when people talk about the workforce crisis, they're talking about how many people we need to recruit and or whether we're going to be able to produce that many people and you know whether we're going to have lots of gaps and stuff. So there's a few things going on here at the same time that are actually quite hard to get your head around. So one is the NHS has actually grown the workforce quite substantially in the last couple of years, about 8 or 9% on the national numbers since uh, pre-COVID times. But the the workforce are under a huge amount of pressure. We've got a lot of complexity um, at this stage that we're at with COVID and and other things. And actually, it's a very tired workforce. It's a very fatigued workforce. So I think the big problem really at the minute is actually the kind of psychological mood of it it all and the feeling that we're under relentless pressure and it's never ending. And, you know, when are are people actually going to be able to see some light at the end of the tunnel? The other bit I'll just add to this, just to add a bit of complexity. I've been doing some walkabouts this week and it's actually also very variable, team to team, water war, department to department. Um, so here in the trust, for example, if you're working, you know, uh, as a surgeon, for example, electively on one of our elective sites, it'll feel probably very much like it did pre-COVID, very normal, very productive, you know, uh, really, uh, really fruitful days. That's very different to being in an AED context or an acute medical ward context or elderly care, where you've just got this constant. Sure. And that's not to say one's easier than the other. It just means that the, the mood and feel of it all is very, very different. So it does feel like we've got a very, very challenging situation from a workforce point of view, but there's lots of dynamics in there as well. No, thank you for that. And I think it's important uh, that point is emphasised. There may be a headline that people... Uh, say, but it's very nuanced by occupation group and region uh, as well. I wanted to broaden the discussion just briefly. We've obviously now entered a new statutory legislative uh, uh, framework uh, with the integrated care systems where integration, collaboration is uh, the spirit uh, to transform. And your own key objectives as part of your mission is to help uh, move away from traditional a hospital-based care so patients can really take part and be partners in determining their own levels of care. I was interested to note the vision includes, of course, social care, uh, marrying up with the uh, uh, NHS. And uh, I know the Trust took a fairly bold and uh, typical uh, approach in one sense uh, of deciding to set up its own home care provision earlier this year, creating, I think, 250 jobs immediately. Can you elaborate a bit on that? Because that's quite a bold move. Yes, yeah, so we've been in various forms of collaboration with uh, with local authority colleagues and social care over the last sort of ten to fifteen years, and that was largely in a strategic commissioning um, sort of joint roles planning perspective. We did have responsibility to deliver social care in Northumberland under a partnership agreement for a, a while. And then a few things happened in the last few years. So that uh, the COVID impact initially made us really think about what we're responsible for and where the 
where the real benefit of integration was at the same time domiciliary care started to get really quite stretched and started to get a bit uh, more aware and concerned about what was happening on the broader social care system. So uh, we don't have a lot of delays, first of all. So I would say generally our partners work with us incredibly well. We will benefit generally from pretty good flow, but other parts of the country obviously struggle from a flow perspective. And we do have problems in domiciliary care in rural areas where the model is exceptionally stretched. So for a quite a long while, we've been thinking about whether we should try and go into that with the view of proving that there's a different model, actually. So I think uh, we would like to employ the people differently on NHS terms and conditions, which is what we're doing. Um, embrace them as part of the broader health and care family, offer skills and uh, educational opportunities for, for our local population, progress and op opportunities for those who chose to, uh, choose to take them, and integrate the service into our community health services over time to prove that it's economically more viable uh, long term. So we've gone live. Uh, we've started the first batch, I think, was about 25 recruits. We will scale up about 250 over the next uh, few months. And um, I think you're hugely optimistic about it all. It's a, it's a very, um, it feels like there's a lot of benefit in it for everybody to get into. And I know there's a lot of interest around the NHS with this colleagues all over the country exploring different ways of doing the same thing. No, no, thank you for that. And I think you're right. The, the interest is significant because uh, the spirit of integration has been talked about, as you know, for decades. Uh, and to see that uh, cross a boundary collaboration in terms of workforce groups, which have traditionally been quite uh, demarcated, I think perhaps bodes well um, for the future. I wanted to tackle, um, before we go into further details around what the Trust is doing to support the workforce, as you mentioned about uh, wellness and tiredness and innovation, uh, clearly uh, to tackle the, the elective situation uh, that you know very intimately. You, you don't take on simple jobs, clearly. Um, but as we entered the year, we were facing um, eye-watering numbers uh, in terms of elective recovery. Um, before we go into the 18-month uh, uh, numbers, I um, want to take the opportunity to congratulate uh, the NHS, yourself, and um, everyone involved, because I think the two-year waiting list numbers, which doesn't get highlighted enough, I think last month NHS providers, uh, NHS England came uh, forward and said it was a great milestone. De facto, I think there's something like 22,500 people waiting over two years at the beginning of the year. Uh, you must be very proud of to have pretty much eliminated that uh, massive backlog. Yeah, I mean, I think the NHS has done an incredible job. When uh, this time last year, when I first started getting involved, we're looking at the two-year wait as heading up maybe up to forty thousand. If we didn't need to get a hold of it quickly, it maxed out at about twenty-six thousand, I think, in January. And as of today, we've got just short of two thousand patients waiting two years. About half of those patients have been offered alternatives and didn't want to take them, so could have been treated. The rest are very complicated patients generally that, you know, they need to stay where they are because of the complexity of what's going to uh, be delivered for them. So the NHS, I think, should take confidence from delivering that in a very, very complicated period. You know, it was a fall when uh, we had Omicron, uh, we had uh, further waves in the spring and summer, which really impacted on staff absence. And stuff. So I think, you know, really, uh, really big confidence builder for the NHS. And uh, when we we'll look into the 78-week um, um, uh, uh, target as well, the, we're in, in play on where we need to be uh, for that. Around the end of October, we hope to be sort of 45,000 or so to be able to deliver where we need to be at the end of the year. And we're, we're in play for that. So we're absolutely pretty much on target to be able to deliver what we need to do. No, that's that's brilliant. And the longer term vision, of course, um, as part of the program uh, is to hit uh, substantially in excess of pre pandemic levels. 30% is the aspirational. Just want to touch upon your uh, uh, missive uh, earlier this week uh, for some of the trusts that are perhaps lagging behind uh, in terms of productivity. Uh, that's going to require some complexity because there's a number of factors. There's a funding squeeze, as we've talked about, um, workforce, social care under, str uh, under strain. Are you as confident about that um, longer term plan? Because that's quite an uh, ambitious target. Yeah. So again, there's, there's a few things to this. So when that was covered last week, it, it wasn't absolutely clear in the article that I was responding to an assertion from a, a colleague who told the HSJ that basically it didn't matter how much work organisations did, they were just going to get paid the full amount. Um, 
which isn't right. You know, so if you've managed to do 105% of 1920 volumes versus somebody next door who's doing 80%, it's not right that everybody gets paid the same amount there when there's such a big uh, difference in activity. So that was, there's a bit of context there that was missing. That was That's what I was responding to. It is also the case that in the same system where there isn't really a difference in COVID prevalence or other kind of local disease complexities, similar providers, similar organisations have big variations in the amount of work that they're doing electively and also their productivity, which has always been the case for us and we're rightly being challenged on it by, by national colleagues and, and government colleagues. Overall, we need to do more elective work in order to be able to um, to shift the backlog in the way that we want to. And um, there's a very broad range from about 105 to 110% 20 volumes, right down to 60-70% of the times at the other end of the spectrum. So that's really what that was about. I think, honestly, I would like us to be able to find ways of reducing waiting times and improving patient experience in more productive ways. And we have shown that there are new pathways being developed all the time that actually in a traditional setting might look like we've done less work. So as an example, virtual group clinics where a clinician might see 15 to 20 people in a, in a clinic using this kind of technology, that's going to be ad- accurate and reflected in our, in our workload. It's a genuine innovation and it's good for people uh, to embrace and stuff. So there is, I am slightly worried about being um, too fixated on 130 percent what we should really be doing is really focusing on reducing waiting times for people and improving their experience no absolutely thank you as you say it, it's a multivalent uh challenge which got many many different levers and moving on to you said earlier clearly the uh ability to meet this challenge uh and support the workforce you talked about in certain cohorts people are tired now you, you're well aware uh, the health and social care select committee reported uh, this time last year summer of 2021 uh, that burnout was at an emergency level we've got the gmc reporting that trainee uh, doctors are two-thirds of them are reporting different moderate to high levels of burnout so th- this is a tremendous issue and one of your uh, trust's core business objectives is to make sure that patients and staff uh, have the best experience possible every day which is a, an amazing aspiration um, just wanted to have the opportunity to hear what you've been doing to make that a reality particularly for the staff uh, to make their experience really the best that you can have yeah Every organisation I come across in the NHS has put a huge amount of effort in the health and well-being and making sure people have, uh, we'll call it different things, but basically um, mechanisms so people can sit down together and talk and unpack uh, what's going on, you know, decent rest space, uh, psychological support where that's necessary, access to counselling if that's necessary, uh, coaching, you know, all those sorts of things. There's a massive array of things in play in the NHS to support people. And we've got our own uh, version of that, including uh, we opened our health and wellbeing centre last year, which includes a gym, lots of cafe space, lots of free space for people to sit and work together or or study or just have some quiet time. So I think we're all getting better at understanding that's an important thing and it's not a waste of time or resources people need, you know, especially now the time to be able to do those uh, sorts of things. Um, locally as well, though, we place massive store in our local staff surveys. So yep. we're national surveys in in train currently, uh, but we also do our own local surveys. And we did see a little bit of a hit in the early summer when there was a lot of COVID around, a lot of absence again, and people just feeling a bit frayed at the edges. They're starting to get worried about bills and those sorts of things. But one of the things that stood out, uh, was there was a, a cluster of questions at point to what we call tools of uh, tools to do the job. Uh, so we've been unpacking them with individual teams, and sometimes that's as simple as a, a wobbly wheel on a tea trolley. Uh, sometimes it's not enough colleagues to meet demand. Sometimes it's a bit of technology that would work, or a resynchronization of how something works with another department. The important bit is listening to people about what's really on their mind. And then having very tailored and specific plans to try and address that. And going back to the earlier point, it is very variable. You know, so literally, you know, two wards 10 metres apart can have a very different feel just depending on what's going on 
with them, whether they've got enough colleagues, whether they had death on the wall the previous day or some other traumatic event or someone's just retired or they've just generally been feeling a bit out of sync. And, and on that, you know, across society, we're all feeling a bit odd about, you know, the last few years. People are worried about fuel bills. They're worried about what's going on in Russia and the U Ukraine. And it's understandable that's having a bit of an impact on people. I've said before, and I genuinely believe it, if you haven't had some kind of impact over the last few years, it's probably something wrong. You know, this, it's been a pretty difficult time. But I also believe we can absolutely talk ourselves into this being really worse than it is. So the negativity is really depressing, and it has a big drain on the staff. People talking down the service, talking too much about what we're not doing rather than what we are. And the NHS is seeing huge numbers of people every day, fantastically well, very timely and responsive, in very difficult circumstances. And, and I, I, I hope we can all just get together and talk about it up and recognise it and acknowledge it. It's, uh, you know, these really difficult times. We're not out of the woods yet. And from a COVID perspective, if you look back through history, uh, big events, um, we probably all naively thought this would be like a few months, maybe a year, and then we'd get over it. We're probably at half time, I think, really, in terms of different waves of complexity that we've got to get through before we genuinely come out the other end into something different. No, no, thank you for that. I think it's important for people to understand what has been delivered, as you say, during extraordinary circumstances. And the other good thing, I think, that comes out, as you said, people are willing to talk about wellness, well-being, and it should be in a balanced manner. I wanted to broaden the sub subject to we're, we're still talking about workforce. We're still talking about meeting inexorable demand. And, of course, technology plays a hugely important role in helping clinicians and, indeed, non-clinicians uh, meet those requirements. There's so much I could cover but a couple of things that really struck me about um the work at the trust one one is to do with obviously the surgical robots that you've got but before that it's some of the innovative work around data ai patient pathways i think uh, professor mike reed dr justin green's work uh, can you give us some light on that because the goal there is to as you say upstream make things more effective so that the pressure on the system is actually averted yeah, so the again, one of the benefits of the last few years across the whole of the NHS and actually healthcare internationally is people have really embraced technology in a different way. It's accelerated a lot of things. I mean, just as simple things like this and uh, virtual interactions with patients pre-COVID, it's very difficult to do. It wasn't being done on any kind of scale, but it has absolutely transformed how people work and created more convenient interactions uh, in an appropriate uh, context and setting. We've got, like a lot of organizations as well, really going big on the robot thing. We've got a slightly different feel here because of our surgical mix, where robots generally in healthcare have been massively used in urology. We're really big in colorectal surgery, so there's massive progress there in urology as well, but in other specialties. Uh, you mentioned Mike Reed's work, which is uh, fantastic in AI and orthopedics. Uh, which is uh, really interesting, quite uh, interesting and unique. Um, I think in terms of that development, we're trialling zone their uh, drones in certain parts of our population to see how useful they can be to move things around in rural uh, rural areas. Uh, we're on the edge of uh, of signing up to a, a triage tool using AI in an AD setting. And then you've got all the virtual ward stuff and other things that are going on out in the, the NHS. We've used the eye in validation mechanisms in the electric program um, over, over the last year or so as well. So there's a lot of really brilliant innovation going on. And I think, again, through history, a lot of big surgical clinical advances have happened in extremists, you know, during wartime or other traumatic events. And I think probably the last couple of years has, has unleashed a bit of a technological leap in how we use data, how we generate data, how we use AI and process automation to support uh, clinical colleagues. And that won't, you know, it's, they're not either or as well. So these are things about how we um, protect clinical um, skills and expertise and use them appropriately, supported by technology, not necessarily uh, replacing them fully by that as well. And I think we are genuinely a, a really interesting point uh, in healthcare with that.
No, and um, we'll we'll keep watching with uh, great interest as these innovations uh, spread out, hopefully through uh, shared learning uh, across the the system. I just wanted to touch on a penultimate subject, and that's the importance of learning and development. The, one of the values of the trust, of course, is that uh, everyone's contribution counts, and the encouragement of learning and development. Uh, one of Newcross's uh, missions is to be a learning partner for life, um, helping ind individuals to develop their careers free at the point of access. Um, you've got some great feedback um, at all levels. I think uh, the British Junior Cardiologists Association were singing uh, the praises. Uh, just wonder, it's a huge topic, but some of the initiatives that you've been developing in terms of leadership and clinical access to um, postgraduate uh, qualifications. Yeah, so again, I, I, there's a lot going on here. There's a lot going on across the whole of the NHS yeah. for this, isn't it? But right back in the, in the 90s, when I first uh, came to the one of the predecessor organisations uh, of Northumbria. There'd been a bit of a rocky period where training experience wasn't brilliant, wasn't as good as it could be, and recruitment was a bit of a problem uh, thereafter um, as a natural kind of follow-on from, from that. So we made a huge investment in time and focus and strategy in improving the learning and development experience right through from when trainee doctors come here for their times here, but also given as much opportunity as possible for people to develop themselves and work at the, the top of the license. And you know, seeing people go through and progress from certain roles into roles that maybe they thought they couldn't aspire to when they first arrived, it's been fantastically um, energizing for everybody to see that happen. Also, actually, operationally and clinically useful to fill gaps and important and key roles. So, we just try and make that possible at every level. We don't always manage to do that for people but you know, there's a hunger and an appetite to try and do that so very much embracing new roles the clinical family where people are focused on competency rather than clinical their siloed backgrounds getting people really to work together and be part of the team part of the family understanding our role in society they you know all those sorts of things and, and honestly just try and you know we we'll spend a lot of time at work Let's try and make it as enjoyable as possible and lean into the evidence that is if you've got happy staff, they're going to do a job for the people that are looking at. It's, it's not that complicated. How you deliver it's complicated, but the core principle of let's let's make it a great place. I think it goes to the heart of one of the uh, issues we, we talk about growing the workforce and 50,000 new nurses and new doctors and all of this type of stuff, international recruitment, which goes to attraction. But I think what you're saying there, if you make uh, a career pathway uh, a great place to work, then retention, because that is the fundamental lever. Uh, we want to grow the workforce. We don't want to lose any of the workforce uh, by doing that. One, one final question, Jim, um, and it's to take a broader perspective. I know it's something that you're very passionate about. Uh, the NHS and trusts up and down the country play a unique role as anchor institutions. And if we're going to turn the dial on managing demand, moving into the community, we have to look at the variable determinants of health. And that, of course, includes socioeconomic factors. You at the Trust uh, take this extraordinarily seriously. You have, I think, half a million people you serve. And you made a community promise back in June 2021 to really contribute across a number of pillars, including education and employment a poverty. Can you broaden that out? Because you've had a chance now a year later to reflect. A lot of things have been done, but it shows where the NHS's vision is can't be confined simply to the trust itself. It's part of a larger matrix. Completely agree. And um, one of the things that got lost at the, at the beginning of the COVID period is we all um, just received the Marmot update just before the first lockdown happened. It was on our, we discussed it in our last board before the first lockdown. And we'd actually gone backwards in lots of ways on the, uh, the, the key moment uh, themes and stuff, which was uh, which was shameful, really. And for us, especially in our population, we were, we were very unsettled by that and really determined to do more. COVID also really struck home the benefit of us really understanding our tie into the community, the strength of community support, the business community, education community. So the community promise was sort of born out of that, some of the supply chain changes that were made on the, the back of that. So we have absolutely made supply chain shifts where we're now making things locally that will be bought from other parts of the, the world. We've got a, an innovation hub that was developed out of our PPE factory built in the first wave of 
with COVID, so various new businesses being generated out. And if there's some in partnership with other providers locally, where hopefully soon we'll be opening a, a medicines productions unit in partnership with Newcastle Hospitals and other providers locally, maybe an NHS laundry. We are producing PPE. Uh, you know, got uh, various other things being developed along those lines. In a range of partnerships with education providers, our council colleagues trying to do more from a poverty perspective or a skills and education perspective. And uh, my one of my first meetings of today was with the new vice chancellor of Northumbria University. There's a very strong alignment on um, our role in local society as being people, organisations that can generate skills opportunities, give people skills to get employment, give them then fruitful employment. And all of that has to improve health long term. You know, we really believe in the long term determinants. This is the time to really take action on that. And in parts of our population, roughly 60% of the population work in the public service. And the NHS is by far the biggest part of that. So I think in that context, and that'll, you know, that'll get worse in the next couple of years, I would have thought we do go into in the recession. So we'll end up present, representing more than 60%. Um, we have a big responsibility with that. You know, the local society, the health and well-being of the population, the employment opportunities of the population are dependent on us. So we need to absolutely do our best when we're spending capital or we're making human decisions um, to really think about how we build a skills um, a pipeline or a, a supply chain pipeline for the future to have as much done locally as possible. And that's absolutely what we're committed to. No, thank you for that. It's very inspiring. I'm well aware that you've been internationally recognised with uh, uh, awards and some of your programmes in schools. I think the mini scrubs uh, uh, programme uh, and the widening participation coordinators that you've you've uh, employed to do that. So uh, we could talk about that forever. I think it seems a, a great and inspiring uh, place to stop the conversation for now, but hopefully we'll re-engage with you in the future. But uh, I'd like to take the opportunity, Sir Jim Mackey, as I always do, to thank you for your time, your candour um, and your uh, your compassion thanks very much good to see you again always a pleasure thanks jim if you've enjoyed this episode of voices of care please like subscribe or follow wherever you receive your podcasts and if you want more information about how we are enabling the healthcare workforce of the future please visit newcrosshealthcare.com forward slash voices of care in the meantime i'm sahail mirza goodbye and thank you mm-hmm.